Um, I don't use it. Uh, I, I don't use. I stopped using Facebook. I was, I was never that active. You know. <laughs> How you found? <laughs> Last time active, 2014 or 15 or something. Yeah. Because normally when I when I spam the link, I tag uh, the the ship name. Right. Mm. Right. Right. Understood. So all the followers will be notified. Right. No, no, I don't do that. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وإمامنا وحبيبنا المبعوث رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I praise Allah Almighty and I send prayers and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his noble family, righteous companions, and all those that follow them with right guidance until the day of judgment. Ameen. Glory be to you, O Allah. No knowledge have we except that which you have taught us. Indeed, you, all, you are the all-knowing, the all-wise. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. It's very nice to be with you again on a bi-monthly basis. Today, insha'Allah, we continue with our series, Islam, the Misunderstood Religion. And today we want to deal with one of the prime misconceptions about the religion of Islam and one of the accusations that is leveled against the religion of Islam and that is that it is an intolerant religion or that it is somehow not amicable towards other faiths and other ideas or ideologies. I will attack this subject, this topic, from two different angles. One being the practical angle and the other one being the theoretical. And allow me to begin with the practical. Even though the normative order would be to deal with it on a theoretical level and then go to the practical. But in this situation, I, can, I don't want to get lost in the theoretical and then not have enough time to talk about the practical. And in all reality, I think I would need more than one talk to really give it justice. But unfortunately, uh, otherwise, Islam, the misunderstood religion, will be a, a one-year or a two-year series. So, for that purpose, I'm going to try to squeeze whatever I can into today, and then we deal with another misconception uh, the next time, inshallah. So, I'll, I want to try to deal with some of those practical examples, which is going to show us, from the very beginning, before we even get into the theoretical, and especially if we have non-Muslim friends present, it's going to show them that tolerance is not just a theoretical concept in Islam, but rather it is a modus operandi. Modus operandi. It's a mode of operation in Islam. And it was practiced for the longest time, as we will see. Any observer and student of history will immediately realize that history was full of conflict 
And to a large extent, much of that conflict was civilizational. Was civilizational. It had a civilizational factor. And when we talk about civilization, we're talking about religion, we're talking about culture, politics. We see that in a lot of the conflict in history. Some of it was pure economics, pure realpolitik, just one people trying to dominate another. Some of it was like that. But a good part of it was also civilizational. It did have to do with religion, it had to do with culture. And you might have all heard of the famous thesis of Samuel Huntington, The Clash of Civilizations. A theory and a book that was widely circulated and commented upon, criticized as well, okay? Some may even say totally debunked, okay? Maybe when we're talking about the present era. But I think when we talk about history, it's not very difficult to see that there was a lot of clash and a lot of it did seem to be civilizational okay having said that when you look at all of that conflict and islam like other religions other empires other political uh, groupings was part of that, that equation. So if you take all of that history of conflict in mind, you may think to yourself, tolerance has no place in the religion of Islam. When you talk about the history of conflict that had occurred and sometimes in Islam's name you may think that therefore tolerance doesn't have a place in Islam however we will see that in fact it is the diametrical opposite so please give me your ears your eyes not so much your noses, your brains, your attention, okay? And try to concentrate because there are going to be a lot of quotations in this uh, talk, all right? So try to follow and inshallah it will be fruitful. One Orientalist confessed, and we are glad that he, had, he confessed, okay? Maybe grudgingly, but he confessed that only the Muslims were able to combine missionary zeal with tolerance. Again, it may seem that these two things are in clash. How can you have missionary zeal, right? The fervor to bring people to your religion Missionary meaning calling people to the religion, calling to Islam. How can you have that and tolerance as well? It's almost as if it's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction, right? He is confessing only the Muslims were able to combine these two ostensibly opposite things. So he's saying the Muslims had missionary zeal, they loved to convert people to their religion, but that did not prevent them from being tolerant. And this is an important confession. And here we say to this Orientalist and his likes, that as you have realized this, you have to now also realize by corollary that 
This must be because tolerance is an inherent Islamic paradigm. As Muslims were able to demonstrate this, this cannot be somehow just the actions of some of those Muslims who are tolerant. It cannot be. Because we see it ummah wide, everywhere the Muslims went. So therefore, we cannot attribute it to those specific Muslims being tolerant, but rather this is something that is inherent in the religion. It's in the texts. It's what the religion teaches. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to demonstrate uh, such tolerance. After the death of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as you all know, the aspirations of Muslims were focused on the blessed lands. The blessed land here being what? Madina. What is it? Madina and Makkah. Madina and Makkah are the lands of Islam. But now, after the death of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, Muslim aspirations are, their eyes are on the blessed land of Al-Shab. Yes. Al-Quds is part of Al-Shab. Be careful. I might have to get up. How did I get up? Oh, I just put these. But this one is... Yes. I, my, my, my hand is itching to, to draw, <laughs> to show you a sham. But uh, what is a sham, brothers and sisters? What's a sham? Sorry? Okay, Syria. Syria is part of sham. Okay, what else? Mecca? Mecca is not part of a sham, it's the blessed land, the, 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 the most blessed of lands. Do I write with this? Or the brother? Oh, okay. Okay, so Syria? Lebanon? Palestine? All of this is part of sham. Allahu Akbar. Turkey also? Which one? Jordan. 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 MashaAllah. All right. <laughs> Interestingly, when I was giving a talk about the, the blessing of the land of Sham, it was kind of a talk about what's happening in Syria, but, a, but from a kind of a religious perspective, religious angle. So I was talking about the, the, the blessed land of Sham, and I had a, it was a PowerPoint presentation, so I showed them the pictures and the map and so on. So after, he, and I showed them some of the authentic hadith, so everyone was excited to be part of Asham. So one sister raises her hand and says, Sheikh, what about Turkey? Is <laughs> Turkey part of Asham? You know, everyone wants to be part of this blessed land. Okay, so we have Syria, right? Tayyib. And then we have Lebanon, right? And we have Jordan. And we have Palestine, right? So all of these, yes, this is all sham. This is all sham. When the Prophet ﷺ talks about the blessing of the land of Asham in the Ahadith, he doesn't only mean Al-Quds. Clear? This is all Asham. These are not our demarcations. These are not our lines. These are the lines of Sykes and Pico. They drew those lines, not us. So we don't have any differentiation. And that's how it always was. So this is a sham. Sham Sharif. And what was it called in English? The Levant. Levant is all of this. Sykes and Pico put these lines. I like to say, 
If Sykes and Picot were to come out of their graves today, they would be shocked. <laughs> you idiots are still following the lines we drew more than 100 years ago. This is what I think they would say. You idiots are still obeying these lines that we just randomly drew on a map over a hundred years ago. This is Asham. And some may say the very northern tip of Saudi Arabia may be part of Asham. Some difference of opinion on, of how to uh, demarcate the, the blessed land of Asham. The point is the Muslim aspiration was towards Asham after the death of Prophet Muhammad As the Muslim armies took one place after another, th these places were inhabited by Orthodox Christian communities. Okay? So keep in mind, when we're talking about Christianity, All the way up until, all the way up until Martin Luther in the early 16th century, 1518 or so, all the way up until this date, the main chasm between or in Christianity is between the two main Christian sects. And they are Catholics and, and the Orthodox. This is the main chasm. Because until now, we don't have something called Protestants. Clear? Protestantism starts in the early 16th century with Martin Luther. So, all the way up until this time, the main chasm is here. And it's a huge chasm. The, the conflict that happened between Catholic Christians and Orthodox Christians is, is difficult to describe. They were mortal enemies of one another. Alright? So, of course, when do Muslims, this is what you can describe as Eastern Christianity here and this is pretty much Western Christianity. So whenever you read a room in the hadith of the Prophet it's talking about Eastern Christians. The Byzantines whose capital is Byzantium. Byzantium is al Constantinia, Constantinople, as we said before, modern day Istanbul. You remember that? Good. All right. So the 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 Muslims were only really exposed. You got. You have to stop me when I go on these historical tangents. Otherwise, we'll never finish. We have to come back to, <laughs> to tolerance. We have to come back to tolerance. Okay, um, the Muslims were only really exposed to Western Christianity, Latin Christianity, with the Crusades. But that's much later, alright? That's in the end of the 11th century, right? 1095, 1099, when the Crusades started. So most of the time, especially in the early period, they are dealing with the Orthodox Christians, the Eastern Christians, okay? So, these Orthodox Christian communities that populated Asham, okay, they actually welcomed the new Muslim rulers. Alright? Why? Because they attributed to them their deliverance from the repressive tyrant Heraclius also known as Hiraql. 
They even saw it, some even saw it, as a manifestation of divine punishment. That God is punishing this tyrant by the coming of the Muslims. So they actually welcomed the Muslims taking over many of the lands of Asham. Because they were being persecuted by their own Christian co-religionists. So now we're talking about a chasm within Orthodox Christianity as well. What are called the Chalcedonian Christians as opposed to the non-Chalcedonian. One anonymous Syriac chronicle quotes the following. In this we gained no small advantage. In other words, it was a, it was a big advantage. In that we were saved from the tyrannical rule of the Romans. So they felt that these Romans, though they are co-religionists, were persecuting them. And now the Muslims have come and delivered them from them. So, when you hear things like this, you immediately make the connection that the rapidity with which the Muslims were able to take over the lands of Asham is definitely due to their ability not to take over the land but to take over the hearts first here are the people welcoming them and seeing them as a ni'mah as a blessing from Allah right otherwise taking over the land of Hashem wouldn't have been that easy we have to realize that so this is religious tolerance In another quotation by one scholar, he says the Byzantine administration, the administration now, was well known for both its high taxation and its strict enforcement of orthodox religious beliefs. Islam was a pleasant alternative, for it was religiously tolerant. And even the taxes that a non-Muslim was obliged to pay, the jizya, were significantly less than those levied by Constantinople. Constantinople being the capital, being Rome, right? At this point, we're talking about the second Rome, Byzantium, Constantinople, right? These victories, my brothers and sisters, paved the way for the bloodless acquisition of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and Al-Quds. It was a bloodless acquisition. There was no blood. There was no bloodshed. There was no killing. A far cry from what will happen during the time of the Crusades. Right? A far cry. In fact, as we know, the presence of Umar ibn al-Khattab was specifically requested in order to receive the key to the city in order for the sorry oops for the patriarch to hand over the city to sayyidina umar ibn al-khattab on one occasion the muslims had to vacate some of these levantine levantine is an adjective of levant so the Muslims had to vacate some of these Levantine cities, okay, in order to face the large army of Heraclius. As they were vacating Hems, and Hems is where? Syria. Syria. At one point it was considered the capital of the Syrian revolution. As they were vacating Hems, in other words, they're leaving it now. They have to all congregate because they have to face Heraclius. Guess what they did? They returned the 
jizya money that they took from the Christians. They, they gave it back to them. <laughs> right? This has never happened to them before. They couldn't believe it. Who are you people? Where did you come from? You know? So they returned whatever money. You think Heraclius would ever return the taxes that he took? Why did they return it? Because the jizya money that they were taking from the non-Muslims is actually, it's like a fee that the non-Muslims are paying for the protection of the Muslims, for the protection of the state. And now they're leaving. So they cannot protect them anymore. So gave, they gave them their money back, refund. Subhanallah. Upon which the Syriac residents replied, Indeed, your rule and justice is more beloved to us than the oppression and tyranny we were under. And with your deputy, they left a deputy, with your deputy, we shall repel the soldiers of Heraclius. So now they're going to fight with the Muslims against Heraclius. When they saw this magnanimity, this toleration, this kindness. Right? This is what we're talking about. This is at a time where Islam is at the peak of its strength. No one can say, oh, the Muslims were weak. It's, it's exactly the opposite. Toleration is an inherent aspect. It's an inherent characteristic of this religion. And the Muslims displayed it uh, in the best way. Of course, similar incidents occurred in some of the other cities that they also had to uh, vacate. We have to understand that all of this tolerance is a practical implementation of the Qur'anic injunction or principle that there is la ikraha fid deen there is no compulsion in religion though we would love more than anything to bring that one person to the religion of Islam but there is no compulsion it doesn't work that way Right? You cannot force anyone. No one, as they claim, was forced into Islam by the sword. This is a myth. A myth that even some of the objective Western scholars started refuting. That this is not true, as we will see. So these newly annexed lands enjoyed freedom of religion under Muslim rule and there was no pressure on them to convert in any way okay nothing is better proof of this than the large number of Jews and Christians that lived under Islamic rule whose religious demographics did not change hardly changed even after the Muslims took that city or that location I'll give you an example after about a century of the celebrated conquest of Syria it was found that Muslims constituted just over how much what was the percentage of Muslims in Syria in this area what's the percentage of Muslims a hundred years after the Muslims entered. When did the Muslims enter? In, in whose reign? Amr ibn Khattab, right? So just a hundred years later, you're talking about 120, 130, right? Hijri. So, what was the percentage of Muslims in Syria after the Muslims entered it? A hundred years later. Hmm. Take a guess. Yes, brother. Yeah, absolutely. You're talking about the Umayyad Khilafa. Khilafa al Umayyah. 60%, okay. Other guesses? 40. 40. Okay. Khilafa al Umayyah. It lasted all the way up 
past a hundred years, right? Maybe. After about a century, it was found that Muslims constituted just over 6%. 6% of a stable population of 4 million. This is according to the study by Corbage and Farg, 1998. What does that tell you? There's no forced conversion. There's no forced conversion at all. Capital yes, and we're talking about the capital of the Khilafah. It's a very good point. So, the Muslims are just 6%. They left the Christians be. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. Right? The Muslims were ruling, yes. They were ruling them by Islam. They were ruling them justly. Right? With the justice of Islam. With the freedom and toleration of Islam. You want to convert? Ahlan wa Right? Later on, as we will see, especially in Spain, yes, people were converting in droves. Actually, some of the Muslims started feeling that we're losing economics. There's no jizya, they're becoming Muslim. <laughs> right? But they understood. And at least Al Khalifa Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was, was teaching people as well that we are not here to collect money, we are here to guide people. If they convert to Islam genuinely, they don't pay the jizya anymore. This is what we want. Leave the economics to Allah, right? Of course, the same was not true, unfortunately, of Christian rule. Places where Christians ruled. Where Jews survived their persecution, but not Muslims. Okay? Listen to this incident. There was widespread voluntary conversion from Christianity to Islam. Where? In an area some of you may know, maybe you brother. In Khurasan. Okay? It's close. Despite the absence of any religious pressure on the indigenous peoples. So people were coming willingly, converting from Christianity to Islam. This annoyed Ishoyab the third, who was an Astorian patriarch, he's a Christian, almost like a priest, he's a patriarch. And he expressed his indignation in a letter to Simeon, the metropolitan of Rev Ardashir and the primate of Persia. He says, I quote, And the Arabs to whom God at this time has given the empire of the world, Behold, they are among you, as you know well. And yet they attack not the Christian faith. But on the contrary, they favor our religion. They do honor to our priests and the saints of the Lord. And they confer benefits on churches and monasteries. Why then have your people of Merv Maru? Why have they abandoned their faith for the sake of these Arabs? So he's basically saying, they didn't put pressure on you, they didn't put a sword on your neck. Why are your people converting in so many large numbers? And then he says, and that too, when the Arabs, as the people of Merv themselves declare, have not compelled them to leave their own religion but suffered them to keep it safe and undefiled if they gave up only a moiety of their goods, the jizya. They didn't want anything from you. Stay with your religion. You just have to give a small jizya. The jizya is symbolic, brothers. It's not like the taxes of Constantinople. The jizya is symbolic. So you say it's just give up a small moiety of their goods. Meaning, it would be ludicrous for some 
ignorant person to say, oh, they were converting so that they don't have to pay the jizya. Ah, baloney. The jizya was nothing, it was symbolic. That's not an incentive for them to change their religion so that they don't have to pay it, right? And he uh, says it clearly here. Thomas Arnold, a famous Orientalist, when he laments the fact that there are not enough Christian documents telling us about the first century after the Hijrah, he refers to this letter I just mentioned as one of the important ones. And this ultimately elucidates the peaceful nature of Islam. How much time do I have? I think to get through all of this, we might do it in three lectures, instead of one. The, yes, Shraib, how much do I have? How much time? 40 minutes. 40? Uh, you can't sit that long, can you? Al-Andalus is another case in point. What's Al-Andalus? Yeah. yeah. Muslim Spain. Right? The time when Muslims ruled Spain. Which was for how long? Yes. Barakallah feek. 800 years. It's a long time. Right? From the first century Hijri in, uh, in CE, we're talking about 700, right? 711 or so. All the way up until 1492, right? The time of Ferdinand and Isabella the Catholic. When they destroyed Islam in Spain. But the word that is usually mentioned in conjunction with Al-Andalus, Muslim Spain, is convivencia. <coughs> it's a Spanish word. And if you know a little bit of English or Latin, you might know that the root of the word seems to indicate what? Convivencia, con, con, together, coming together, right? Something along those lines, right? Convivencia just means the almost, almost relatively utopian coexistence that happened during the time of Muslim Spain. In fact, when you talk about coexistence, especially in history, Muslim Spain is the, is the archetype example, the archetypical example of coexistence. A time where Muslims, Christians and Jews lived peacefully. Where non-Muslims were contributing as much as the Muslims to civilization. This is in Muslim Spain. You cannot find this anywhere else. And that's why this term was used, convivencia. Okay? Again, there may be some who will try to detract from it and say, no, it wasn't a utopia and this and that. Well, I mean, there is no fully perfect utopia. But especially for that time where empires are at each other's throats, that was an amazing example. Truly amazing example. In fact, many people might even say we wish we could relive live the convivency of Spain. Maybe even nowadays. And that was some 1500 years ago. Okay? Or say a thousand years ago during the time of Muslim Spain, and especially in the first few centuries after the Muslims ruled and entered Spain. This is why Jews migrated to Muslim Spain in their thousands. 
so many thousands of Jews migrated to Muslim Spain. And it is no exaggeration when one of them called it their salvation. The Jewish salvation where the Muslims rule in Spain. Subhanak Ya Rab. How ironic, right? So here are the Jews finding their salvation under Muslim rule. And here we are in the 20th and 21st century. And the only real military occupation we have in the world is under the Jews. And they are occupying Muslim lands. How ironic. They forgot their history? No, they didn't forget. They know their history. So that's why the Jews call that, and historians call it, the Jewish Golden Age. The time where Jews were in Muslim Spain. Okay? As we know, the Convivencia did not last. There was a Reconquista movement whose purpose was to get Spain back and bring it under the fold of Christianity again. And they succeeded in 1492 when they took the last Muslim stronghold in Granada and started their campaign to decimate whatever was left of Muslims in Spain. And of course, the famous, notorious, rather, institution, which they began, also known as, what is it known as? How did they destroy Islam in Spain? The Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition. Whereby scores of Muslims and Jews for that matter were thrown out of Spain. There was a mass exodus of the Jews. And whoever was left in Spain was tortured many times to death. Or, the other option is to become Christian. So if anybody forced people into their religion by the tip of the sword, it was the Christians in Muslim Spain. After establishing convivencia for centuries, the Christians started the notorious Spanish Inquisition. Some of the most unspeakable torture that happened, happened during that period to Muslims because they refused to apostatize and leave Islam. In fact, according to Karen Armstrong, she calls it the most evil of all Christian institutions, the Spanish Inquisition. And that what had that that Spanish Inquisition turned centuries of Muslim toleration and convivencia on its head, right? And that's when Spain, according to these Catholic Christians, became a homogeneous nation. Subhanallah, the tyrants always like the word homogeneous. I also like that word. But I like it from a chemical engineering perspective, right? When you make something homogeneous, you blend it. But when it comes to peoples, when you say homogeneous, you mean you completely destroyed other cultures or ideologies and you only left one type. Exactly the opposite of what the Muslims did. We said 6%. Is that homogeneous? It's homogeneous in the Christian. On the Christian side, not on the Muslim side. It's totally heterogeneous. But once the Christians come and oppress, they want to make it homogeneous. Bashar al-Assad used the same word. Now, during the Syrian revolution, 
as he was starving one town after another okay especially in in central Syria and in the south especially in Al-Ghuta the blessed area of Ghuta and he said now we have a homogeneous population in other words only people who do sujood to him right so homogeneity is something the tyrants like again I mean there's so much to say so I'm just kind of let's fast forward to the Ottoman period or let's call it Al-Dawla Al-Uthmaniyya Osmanli right brother you speak Turkish you yeah, Turkish yeah okay good so so you can correct my pronunciation if there's an issue less than half a century before the thriving civilization in Al-Andalus breathed its last the Byzantine capital at Constantinople had finally fallen so when did Spain become Christian? 1492 when did Constantinople become Muslim? Eight, nine, eight, eight, four, five. Eight, five, four. 1453 857 Hijri Unfortunately brother A lot of us were only do, dealing with the Gregorian calendar 1453 Yawmul Qiyamah For the Christians The last day Al Yawm Al Akhir 1453 that's what they called it if Constantinople fell Byzantium the capital the second Rome for over a millennium more than a thousand years this is the last day for them how much between it and what happened in Spain less than half a century less than a yeah less than half a century right less than 50 years Constantinople became Muslim Spain became Christian okay in the words of one author he puts it very nicely he said Spain and Anatolia Anatolia being Turkey Constant Constantinople Spain and Anatolia changed hands at about the same time almost the same time right Christians expelled the Moors from Spain the Moors being the Muslims Christians expelled the Moors from Spain while Muslims conquered what is now Turkey every Muslim was driven from Spain put to the sword or forced to convert whereas the seat of the Eastern Orthodox Church remains in Istanbul to this day. Imagine. Yeah, you can say. Uh... So who of these two is tolerant? Where does tolerance lie? Very interestingly, If you really understand that this is the last day, you might as well die if you're an Orthodox Christian and your capital just fell, okay? Taken by the Muslims. If you really understand how serious this matter is, it will only make you more shocked to hear the following. The impending threat of the siege, the siege that eventually led to the fall of Constantinople, was so dire that Emperor Constantine Pelologos found himself compelled 
to seek the immediate assistance of Latin Christendom. So now, you have the Orthodox Christians calling on their arch nemesis, the Latin Christians. And they've been fighting each other forever. The crusade in 1204. The crusades were between, again in CE, 1099 and 1291, right? In 1204, the crusade was not against the Muslims. It was the, the Latin Christians against the Eastern Christians. They, they, they plummaged uh, Constantinople. Their own co-religionists. So now, but this is Al-Yawm Al-Akhir. This is serious. So now he feels compelled he has to seek the assistance of his arch enemy, right? Many Greeks objected, Greeks, Eastern Orthodox, many of the Greeks objected to the emperor's request and even an indicated a preference for the Turks. Let the Turks come <laughs> rather than our own Christian co-religionists, okay? Is this an inclination towards the Muslims? Not likely. It seems more like Greek abhorrence of the, the Latins, the Latin Christians, okay? Byzantium's Constantinople their own Grand Duke, famous Grand Duke, Lucas Notaras, is popular for his caustic remark when he said, quote, he had rather behold in Constantinople the turban of Mahomet, turban of Muhammad, than the Pope's tiara. or a cardinal's hat. So in other words, I'd rather see a Muslim turban rather than a cardinal's hat or a pope's tiara. Look at the, the, the enmity between them, the animosity, subhanAllah, right? And actually the Quran talked about this as well. And this is why as Emperor Constantine was riding through the streets, the, you could hear the general public shouting, better we turn Turk rather than Latin. We'd rather become Turk rather than become Latin. It's very interesting. Definitely they must have heard and realize the tolerance of the Muslims as well. Where have you heard these things before? Have you heard these things before? Have you read them? No. You'll definitely not hear it in the media. Much less some of the scholarly works and books. This is the tolerance of Muslims. This is, the, this is our legacy, right? We need to know this. So, the fall of the second Rome, this one, after its millennial legacy, was a more historic occurrence than the end of Muslim Iberia that followed four decades later. This is more historic than this. Therefore, it could have easily produced similar horrific oppression of the indigenous population. Why wasn't this like this? Even though this is more historic, the Muslims could have annihilated the Christians. It's not the way of the Muslims. Even as Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, he started talking. He's the one who obviously 
performed the conquest, he started talking to the Eastern Christians and gathering them. Not slaughtering them, forcing them into Islam, or exiling them as happened just four decades later in Iberia. Let us quickly look at the situation of Ahl al-Kitab in Ad-Dawla al Okay, Many of those who were religiously persecuted in Europe after the uh, Turks got al qustantiniyah and you have to remember that this is a, a time of strength for Ad-Dawla al Uthmaniyah. The time of weakness doesn't start till approximately after 1571 with the battle of Lepanto after that weakness starts to set in even though there's still another three centuries or so for it to fall right but weakness started to set in actually with the son of Sulaiman al-Qanuni Salim al-Thani that's when weakness started but up until this time this is the age of strength for Ad-Dawla al Uthmani. Okay? So for many of the religiously persecuted, guess what? The Ottoman Empire, as they call it, was a refuge. Many of the religiously persecuted Christians and Jews sought refuge in, again, as we saw in Iberia, in Spain, sought refuge in Muslim lands, in Anatolia, Turkey, right? It was a prime destination. And what the Turks implemented is a system they called the millet system. Milla, from Milla, right? And the roots of this millet system originate in Islam and Islamic laws concerning what is called Ahl al Dhimma. Okay? And this is why the sublime port, meaning Ad Dawla al Uthmaniyya, they gave unprecedented privileges to these non-Muslims that were living uh, in their land. Okay? These freedoms, brothers and sisters, were so wide-ranging, okay, that Many Western scholars have to admit those that too much freedom that was given to the Europeans entering the lands of the Ottoman Empire, it was that too much freedom that was given that eventually also contributed to the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Too much tolerance, too much freedom. Eventually, it came back to bite them. And we remember that when we talk about another famous paragon of tolerance in history, Salah al-Din Ayyubi. Salah al-Din at times was criticized for being too tolerant, too merciful, even towards the enemy. Not the other way around. Even though he's hailed as the Muslim hero who got Palestine back and Al-Aqsa back from the Crusaders. He must be a monster. It's the other way around. And the Christians are the first per people to admit it. And he was criticized at times by Muslims and some Muslim historians as well. Too much tolerance, right? This is our history, not the crap you see on television or spouted by Islamophobes and other enemies of the religion. Okay, there's a lot about what happened in uh, the Ottoman Empire. So they kept on giving them concessions and concessions and concessions and eventually these European communities started forming almost mini-states within the greater empire. And this eventually led to the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, obviously in addition to other things. 
I mean, every empire, civilization goes up and down. And the Ottoman Empire was getting weak. But this is one of the important contributing factors as well. Let me just give you some of the uh, key examples of Islamic justice and tolerance, leniency. I told you that Western, objective Western scholars and historians were realizing that Islam never actually converted people by the edge of the sword. <coughs> Don't take my word for it. The famous historian of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon. Nobody can argue about him. He says, a pernicious tenet has been imputed to the Muhammadans. The Muhammadans are the Muslims. Right? They used to, just like they attribute themselves to Christ, being Christians, they say the Muhammadans or the Muhammadans in reference to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he's saying a pernicious tenet has been imputed to them. The duty of extirpating all other religions by the sword. This charge of ignorance and bigotry is refuted by the Quran. They, they used to spell it Quran still. Their knowledge of Islam is still quite limited. They don't call it the Quran, the Quran, right? With a K. This charge of ignorance and bigotry is refuted by the Quran, by the history of the Muslim conquerors, and by their public and legal toleration of the Christian worship. Right? So this is your own historian par excellence of the Roman Empire. He's not a historian of Islam, he's a historian of the Roman Empire. And he is saying this, and he's exonerating Islam of what he called a pernicious tenet. That this is not correct, and this is not Islamic, right? Interestingly, Norman Daniel says that toleration had no place in medieval Christendom, as it did within what he calls strictly defined limits in medieval Islam. And he cited the disappearance of Muslim communities living under Christianity, as opposed to Jews and Christians living under Muslim rule. During this acquisition of Jerusalem, something very memorable happened between Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab and the patriarch, known as Patriarch Sophronius. Umar refused to pray inside the church. You heard this, how many have heard this story? This is famous, everyone knows it. Everyone should know, right? Why, why didn't he want to pray in the church? Because it's haram? Why? Yes, brother? Pictures. Pictures. Okay. Why? Yes, brother? Because he do not want a Muslim to come to, to preach to him. Ah, barakallah feek. Umar ibn Khattab is looking ahead. If he prays there, what's going to happen years down the line? Muslims will come and say, our Amir al-Mu'mineen prayed here. So they'll raise the church. He's afraid of that. So he refused to pray. Allahu Akbar. Umar ibn al-Khattab, who is sometimes accused of being a strong personality and maybe he was harsh and this and that. Look at the way he's thinking. So there are different accounts of the dialogue that occurred. But this is an interesting account of uh, a learned Christian authority that I will quote to you. The Melkite Patriarch of Alexandria, known as Eutychius Sa'id ibn al-Batriq. Those of you who speak Arab, Arabic might have heard of Sa'id ibn al-Batriq. He says, when the time of prayer approached, 
Omar said to Patriarch Sophronius, I want to pray. So, the Patriarch responded, Commander of the Faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen, pray in the place where you are now. And Omar said, I do not want to pray here. The Patriarch then led him to the church of Constantine, the church of the resurrection, also known as Kaniset al-Qiyamah, where he spread a mat made of straw on the floor of the church. But Umar said, I do not want to pray here either. He went out to the steps which are at the gate on the eastern side of the church of Saint Constantine. And he prayed alone on the steps. Subhanallah. Then he sat down and said to Patriarch Sophronius, Patriarch, do you know why I did not pray inside the church? He said, I do not know, commander of the faithful. Umar said to him, if I had prayed inside the church, you would lose it. And it would have gone from your hands, because after my death, the Muslims would seize it, saying, Umar has prayed here. But give me a piece of, uh, almost like papyrus, to write a document. And he wrote that Muslims should not pray on the steps as a congregation but rather individually. And that they should not gather here for the purpose of communal, congregational prayer. Nor should be called together by the voice of a mu'addin. Allahu Akbar. Look at the tolerance. Look at the justice. This tolerance towards the Christians in Al-Quds was not restricted to not interfering in their affairs. It went beyond that. The Christians at times would request them, the Muslims, to arbitrate some of their differences. Some of their own differences. Out of confidence in their justice. In their objectivity. Subhanak ya Rabb. And we know that Umar ibn Khattab gave the people of Jerusalem the aman, right? The assurance of security, okay? And this ultimately ended centuries of religious intolerance, even in the area of Al-Quds, okay? It was the aman of Sayyidina Umar which made this place a, a place of peace, Al-Quds has been the object of conflict for centuries, right? Between different empires. We know that the, the story mentioned in the Quran of how the Romans and the Persians were vying for it, right? This is Al-Aqsa, this is Palestine. So the Persians were, were vying for it, the Romans, Okay, and civilizations before that. So there was a lot of conflict in Al-Aqsa, in Al-Quds. I, I remember reading a nice uh, comment. I think it was by Karen Armstrong. And she's written plenty on, on, on Islamic religious history as well as Palestine. And she visited. She can. So she said, when I, when I stood in the church there, I almost froze in awe, thinking about the amount of bloodshed that occurred in history in order to take control of this place. But that all changed. Now, I'm, these are my words. These are no longer end quote for Karen Armstrong. Just the fact that, you know, she was thinking about all of the bloodshed that occurred before and she's standing there now. Now I am saying, all of that changed with the Iman of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab that he gave to the people of Palestine. It again became a place of bloodshed when what happened? The Crusaders came and took it for that short uh, period, less than a century running out of time as you can well see
What is it? 10 minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes. Huh. I told you I talk about the theoretical. It seems you guys are enjoying the practical. <laughs> you forgot about the theoretical. So I have to do the theoretical in 10 minutes. All right. Let me just say quickly, were there exceptions to the rule? Yes, there were exceptions. Was everyone so magnanimously tolerant? Not always. There were exceptions. And I have some of those exceptions, I don't have time to mention them. But you know what's more important than the exceptions? That whenever there was an exception, a violation of the mo uh, modus operandi of tolerance, there was someone to correct it. There was someone to say, this is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is against Islamic principles. Even at the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, Of course at the time, people were still close to the time of Jahiliyyah. It takes time to reform themselves. So there may be certain manifestations of that, the practice of the time of Jahiliyyah. But there was always someone to say, this is wrong. People would not be quiet. Because this was part of Al-Amr bil-Ma'roof and Nayyal an al-Munkar. Even if it was dealing with the non-Muslims. But I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into those examples. So, my brothers and sisters, When we talk about tolerance, I feel the matter is largely misunderstood. Tolerance today is understood by many to mean almost a wholesale acceptance of the other person and his beliefs and his ideology. But I claim this is a very erroneous definition of tolerance. In fact, it's almost farcical because if I accept you and I almost agree with what you think and what you say and I almost find credence in what you believe it's no longer called tolerance it's called we're very close we're very close in thinking we're very close in ideology so these Christians who are fighting each other for centuries in reality they're quite close and they can be tolerant of one another they just have some differences about you know, the, the, the single nature or the dual nature of Christ. Fine, there are issues of creed, of aqidah, but they're not that huge. They're not that different. So, this is not where tolerance comes in. You're already quite similar. Tolerance comes in when we are drastically different. Tolerance means something when I am most vehemently opposed to what you believe or think on a theoretical level. But on a practical level, I'm able to show you respect, to treat you well, and to be tolerant of you. This is tolerance. This is the ultimate definition of tolerance. So nowadays, everyone wants to say tolerance is almost like I have to accept you wholesale. Almost like we have to say, if we were talking about, say, Christianity, 
that, oh no, we can accept that, you know, the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, maybe metaphorically. No, we can never accept anything like this. And this is ultimate kufr, and the Quran is unequivocal about this. Will that lead to intolerance? For a Muslim, no. Similar to the comment of that Orientalist, when he talked about being able to demonstrate two seemingly contradictory things, missionary zeal and tolerance. Similar here. The Muslims are the only ones who can really combine complete aversion to the other party's aqidah because we realize it's all kufr but still be tolerant of them and show them respect and be just with them because Allah loves justice Allah loves the just this is tolerance this is the ultimate definition of tolerance I don't have to in any way accept your aqidah I am, my aqidah is diametrically opposed to yours. One is iman and the other is kufr. Clear as that, clear as day, right? But, I can be tolerant. And I was tolerant. And the entire history of Islam demonstrated that tolerance in the most beautiful way. In, a, in saying it in another way and we know of course all of the textual evidence talks about the importance of aqidah tells us clearly that everything else is kufr but despite that we talk about even a higher level of tolerance towards ahlul kitab right because there are certain legislative matters between us and Ahlul Kitab that do not apply to others. Because their origin is from Allah. Their origin, before it was corrupted, was a truly monotheistic religion. So they have a special place. Again, this is a demonstration of that tolerance. Right? To the extent that you can even marry a Jew or a Christian. Even though you must understand and believe that what they are worshipping, if it is something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are associating part of them, it is kufr. But yet, there is another connection between you. Allah allowed it, subhanAllah. Right? There is love and respect between you as husband and wife. Even though you view, technically, you view her as a disbeliever. And maybe she views you as a disbeliever. By the way, it's not unidirectional. Keep that always in mind. They view you as a kafir as well. Yeah. You are kuffar according to them. Right? And that's why kafir is a pejorative term even in English. Kafir or kafir. It's, it's a pejorative term, right? They used to call us the, the heathens, right? The Saracens, sometimes even the Turks. At the time of the, the, the Turks, Turk meant Muslim and Muslim meant Turk, you know? So, I say, it is the concomitant existence of humane treatment and such an extreme rejection of another system's, another, uh, another's system of belief and praxis which makes Islam's substantiated history of tolerance truly awe-inspiring. So when you look at all of the stories we mentioned about tolerance, practical tolerance, the history of Muslim tolerance, when you add to that the unequivocal 
aversion and rejection of Islam, of any aqidah other than its own, it makes all of that tolerance and toleration even more awe-inspiring. Those stories are enough on their own. Even if we were, like others, not so uh, inclined to the issues of aqidah, okay, orthodoxy. Maybe, let's say we were more like the Buddhists. Ah, it's all good. You worship Buddha, you worship dirt, you worship the wall. It doesn't matter, right? So let's say, you know, just hypothetically, that was our aqidah. Ah, it's all good. Still, those stories of tolerance are all inspiring. But then when you see that Actually, the Muslims are the most strict when it comes to the issue of orthodoxy and aqidah. You are even more inspired with awe when you read about all of that tolerance and peaceful coexistence that we promoted. Allah Ta'ala a'lam wa ahkam. Jazakumullahu khayran. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين. Yes. Precisely. Precisely my point. So a lot of people are equating toleration with accommodation. Almost like, you know, let's worship your God one day and you worship ours one day as the the, the kuffar of old. Uh, used to say this is not this is not what tolerance is about this is why i'm trying to correct this misconception everyone seems to think tolerance means that as you tell me and try to explain to me how god is uh, a statue or he's the sun and the moon or that he's a human being or that he is the son of god or god incarnate they almost think that they want me to nod as they are saying that. No, this is, this is clear as sunlight for a Muslim. And this is totally unacceptable. But that does not in any way detract or vitiate from my tolerance. This is what we're trying to say. You think that these Muslims that demonstrated this tolerance, Umar ibn Khattab, when he was doing this, he didn't think Sophronius is a kafir? Or a disbeliever? Omar al Khattab was wishy-washy on aqidah, that's why he, he was so tolerant and I don't want to pray in the church and this and that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> they were even more strict when it came to these issues. That doesn't touch tolerance. Tolerance is a different domain. That's why I said here, Let me see. A higher level of manifested tolerance need not mean greater acceptance. The relationship, mathematically speaking, is unidirectional. And this is the crux of the misunderstanding of tolerance as a concept. Tolerance is a practical phenomenon, not a spiritual or intellectual one. Thus, practicing tolerance need not derive from an acceptance of another's beliefs and or culture at all. In fact, true tolerance is the display of humane treatment despite the rejection and possibly a fierce one of another's system of belief and praxis. So that's, that's the whole idea. People do not differentiate. So they think tolerance, that means I have to totally accommodate. Right? Almost as if I have to accept what you're saying as true. It's not the case. That's not what tolerance is about. And this history shows that it is indeed achievable. And achievable to a level people are finding difficulty implementing even in our day. Yeah.
And all of this, brothers and sisters, as you see, is not under a secular system. In all of this history, was there such a thing as secularism? No. It was under Muslim rule. So when the enemies of Islam keep trying to fear monger, right? And scare everyone, oh, Islam is coming, Sharia is coming, Khilafah is coming. These people are, you know, as if we are Ya'juj and Ma'juj and we're going to yeah, destroy the world. Habibi, the world never knew tolerance until the Muslims came. When Muslims were ruling, the world enjoyed peace. There was true civilization, there was true coexistence under Muslim rule. Right? This is a, and this is a, a very critical point as well. Anything else? Yes, brother. How long has the Western Christian and the Eastern Christian are fighting? How long? Very long time, brother. More than a thousand years. More than a thousand years. Until, until Protestantism was born. After Protestantism was born, the, and of course Orthodoxy, was no longer that important because of the fall of their capital. So, it almost, you know, this conflict between Protestantism and Catholicism almost substituted what conflict there was between Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity. But it wasn't as fierce. This was brutal for over a thousand years. Yeah, mashallah. Excellent question. Mashallah. Mashallah. So, where is Orthodox Christianity today? Russia. 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 Mainly Russia, right? So, this is why when Samuel Huntington talks about civilizations, he calls it Orthodox civilization, obviously represented by Russia. Even though Orthodox and Catholicism or Protestantism nowadays, ah, they don't seem so different. Right, on a geopolitical level, you have Russia and the US at loggerheads, even though it's not at the level of the Cold War, though some people were afraid it might develop into that, especially after what happened with the annexation of Ukraine and so on and so forth. But Sometimes their, uh, their positions are not that different, right? They'll, they'll, they'll work together, okay? Maybe against a common enemy. So that's why he, he even talked about having different civilizations, even in the United Nations. Different civilizations. If this is, if Orthodox, the Orthodox civilization is represented by Russia then who are the five permanent members of the Security Council in the United Nations? China, China Russia, Russia France, France, Britain and US, US. <laughs> US France and UK are all part of one civilization Western civilization so Western civilization has three permanent seats. This is unfair. The other seat is for Orthodox civilization. And the last one is for Cynic civilization, the Chinese civilization. Where is the Muslim civilization? Not represented. Where is Islam? There is no Islam. You just have Malaysian Islam. Indian Islam, African Islam, Arab Islam, right? Russian Islam, Turkey. Turkish. You, you, we divided Islam into all of its different countries. 
Furthermore, we divided it into ideologies. You have Ikhwani Islam, Sufi Islam, Salafi Islam, uh, Tablighi Islam, Jihadi Islam, Allahu Akbar. Allah Musta'an. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to unite the Ummah. Anything else? Yeah. What's up, brother? Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Yeah, when you say the, the supper are wrong, so what is the first room? The first room is Rome. <laughs> so in Rome, Rome in Italy. Yeah. So it means that when we have the supper room, then we still have the second room is Byzantium. Yeah, the Byzantium. So we still have the first room. No, now we have the third room. The third room. So Moscow, yeah, where was <laughs> the, the seat of orthodox yeah, uh, was civilization. Of, huh? yes, what was the existence of the first room? The first room is uh, way before. And uh, the, what is called the, the, the Western Roman Empire, which fell in the late 5th century. In the late was that before Islam? Before Islam, yes. A little bit before Islam, yeah. And that's why most of the interaction of the Muslims at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was with Eastern Islam, with the Byzantines, a room. So the, before the death of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, how was the area of Muslim Empire? Before the time of the Prophet ﷺ? At the time of death of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. At the time of his death. Only Arabia. Only Al Arabia, Makkah and Medina, that's it. And, then and it slowly it started to spread to the rest of Arabia, and then to Asham, and then to Iraq, and Faris, Persia, the Persian so Empire, which finally fell also at the hands of Sayyidina Umar. And this is why you need to know, since we mentioned it, why do you think the, 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 the Persians hate Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab so much? For that reason. Because he is the one who ended their empire, the Persian Empire. Okay? So until today, the grave of the one who assassinated Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, it stands in Iran. Abu Lulu al Majus, it's there. And when the scholars, the Sunni scholars, tried to convince them in dialogues between the Sunni and the Shia, when the Sunni scholars tried to tell them, you know, if you want to achieve some kind of proximity between the Sunni and the Shia, at least for God's sake, <coughs> remove this shrine that you have for the, the, for the killer of, of Umar ibn Khattab. They refused. This is the, the abhorrence they have of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab. He's the one who finished them. Anhu arda. And, and a, lot of the, uh, a lot of Shiite fervor today is also somewhat nationalistic. Persian. The Persian glory against the Arabs, the Arab barbarians. Yeah, of course. A lot of it is Persian. That's why they want to call it the Persian Gulf. Sorry, brother, I keep interrupting you. That's why they want to call it the Persian Gulf as opposed to the Arabian Gulf. Yes. So, Prophet Salaam yeah. sent letters to the king of... Gulf. Exactly. Uh, Many of the kings, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, one of them was Oman. Uh, right, Gulf, right, and, and Bahrain and... Yeah, so, 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 the, uh, so the what are you trying to get so, to? So the Romans conquered... Uh, this is it, this is it. Because the Romans had this area. This is, this is where the Romans were really dominant, in Asham. And this is where the, the, the Muslims quickly spread, right? So they're in Arabia, which is south of the Levant. So they started spreading into the rest of Arabia, up north, right? I don't have a map here. So from Arabia, they started spreading up north to Asham, okay? 
and then further east towards Iraq, Iran, <coughs> further down the line, Mawara and Nahr, to your areas, brother, right? The central Soviet republics, slowly, slowly started. And of course, part of it also went west towards Egypt and Libya, right? And eventually taking the whole north coast of Africa, right? So how, uh, which is the best reference for study this history, uh, the, the spreading of the map of Islam? It depends. I mean, there are some decent books. Some of them are history. Do you, you don't read Arabic, do you, brother? No. You don't read Arabic, yeah. Um, some books focus on the conquest of Sham only. Others talk about Al Iraq and Faris, Persian Empire, and then going a little bit further. It's probably good to read it in a in a history book, okay? Unless you really want to go into detail of each one. If you read it in a several volume history, okay, that might be helpful. I can try to give you some, uh, you know, maybe I can send you some references that will be helpful. But to be honest, there's a lack. There's a lack of proper study and resources on these issues, unfortunately. Even though it's our own history. And uh, a good part of it is in Arabic. Yeah. So inshallah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grant us yani, the, the ability and the time to try to fill that gap. Because there's a gap. There's a gap. Especially in the English language. Yeah. So that Muslims can really better understand uh, their history and their roots. Yeah. Some of the Arabic books have been translated, but I feel there's a there's definitely a, a gap and a need. Yes, brother. Yes, tell me, Hadji. I would like to know whether um, Saad Abdi Wakas yes. has spread Islam to the China. Wallahi, Allah alam, this issue of getting to China, it seems to be maybe a little bit weak. But Saad ibn Abi Waqqas was, of course, the shining name in the conquest of Iraq and Persia. Yes, absolutely. But going as far as China, Wallahu alam, may not be authentic. Yeah. But Iraq and Persia? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I'm saying, Ali. But you know, there, uh, there's talk that Saad ibn Abi Waqqas went as far as China and so on. That's another uh, very interesting aspect to study the beginning of Islam in China. Okay, and that that is also quite old. Anything else?